Happy weekend, everybody. Grab a cup of coffee and settle in as we continue our ever-long discussion about one of my top three favorite peptides, Sermorolin. And I can assure you, if it's not in your top three, it's likely in your top 100. It seems that plenty of people have enjoyed the videos where we assess a more mainstream POV, and today we're going to do that with Andrew Huberman in one of his earlier podcasts. So consider it a time capsule, if you will. And I know that in some of my videos, I'm a bit critical of things he says about peptides, but one, I feel it's my responsibility and I think if he ever stumbles upon one of my videos, he'd probably appreciate it. And two, I'm a huge fan of his and I appreciate how he changes with the research. And if you've followed him for a while, you'll hear that he is truly a man of science and truly a man of the people. But enough of that gushy stuff, Valentine's Day has since passed. Although we have been covering quite a few of these more popular topics, in my YouTube profile you'll find that many less covered peptides do have videos there as well, from Cartilax to Selank and Ritatratide and plenty of others. And if there's a video you want to see, let me know. Every single viewer request has been turned into a video except for one, which is currently in the pipeline. And even though I never saw myself at 1,000 subscribers, we're nearing 1,500, so if you haven't already, throw us a subscribe. Enough rambling, let's get started already. Ready. So these days you hear a lot about peptides. I'd like to clarify a little bit about what peptides are. Peptides is a really huge category of biological compounds. Peptides are just strings of amino acids, right? So we've talked about L-tyrosine, arginine, ornithine. Those are amino acids. Those are individual amino acids. And those are put together into little small peptides or they're what are called polypeptides, which are just longer peptides. Turns out that for any substance like growth hormone or growth hormone releasing hormone, it's made up of different amino acids in different sequences, just like your genes are made up of A's and G's and C's and T's, nucleotides in different sequences. It's like a recipe. Peptides tend to be short sequences of amino acids that resemble a hormone enough or resemble some other peptide enough that it can lead to the similar or same effects when you inject them. So for example, we make growth hormone releasing hormone from our brain, which stimulates growth hormone from the pituitary. You're probably getting tired of me here, uh, saying that by now. Funny enough, I've actually felt that way quite often when I'm talking about the GHRH pathway. So if I do sound like a broken record, just let me know, let me know, let me know. But People now will take things like sermorelin, S-E-R-M-O-R-E-L-I-N, sermorelin, which is not the entire peptide sequence of growth hormone releasing hormone, but it's a subset of those. And when people inject it before they go to sleep at night, is typically how it's done on an empty stomach, then that stimulates the release of growth hormone from the pituitary. So this is not taking growth hormone, this is taking the stimulating hormone or what's often called a secretagogue or a mimic, all right? It causes a, a secretion of the hormone that one wants. People will do this for thyroid hormone too. Some people are doing this by prescription with a real medical need. Other people are doing it for just longevity reasons, which kind of falls into that gray zone of they wouldn't die without it but they want to enhance their life. And so they're doing that because they believe it's the right thing for them. Prescription. Sermorlin is prescription. Do they work? Yes. Do they shut down your natural production of growth hormone releasing hormone? Well, there the answer is yes, but some of these peptides actually have the effect of changing gene expression. Remember way back to the beginning when I was talking about hormones, they can actually change gene expression and they can actually set pathways in motion for continued production of a hormone, even if you stop taking the compound. Now that can be good or that can be bad because as you recall, growth hormone in big, uh, big increases in growth hormone that are short lived like sauna, or I, you know, I should say exercise or arginine or sauna, it seems like has these huge effects. Um, or, early nights, you know, first phase of sleep early in the night, these sorts of things. Those are transient, but when one is injecting over and over a constant level, you can put into action gene expression programs that can be long lived. And let's say you have a particular tumor in the body. Tumors will grow when they see growth hormone, even if it, that tumor is unhealthy for you, right? You've got growth of tissues all over the body. So again, I'm not saying whether or not people should do these things or not doing them. One thing I do know is that they are in very prominent use um, in the movie industry. People who want to peel off body fat quickly, they do increase recovery time. They increase healing rates. People are also injecting things like gastric peptides. They're actually stomach peptides that we talked about in the previous episode, things related to the ghrelin pathway. 
and other things from the liver that can improve the rate of tissue and wound healing. You can bet that in the upcoming Olympics, a lot of people are using peptides and compounds and I'm not pointing fingers at anyone in particular. It's just, this is separate from hormone augmentation of like injecting GH or injecting testosterone. People are now working further up the pathways. Other names of some of the peptides are things like ipermorlin, um, tessamorlin. Some of these have clinical uses. Others have just been made as compounds for people in the kind of uh, longevity field or the um, self-augmentation field, if you will. So just a quick reminder, sermorolin is an analog of GHRH, growth hormone releasing hormone, and known as GHRH-129. It's just that, the first 29 amino acids of the total 44 that make up GHRH. And so while it does fall under the category of a growth hormone secretagogue, this is a broad term as you Huberman describes, and these different peptides act at different places within this pathway. So for instance, ipomorelin and GHRP2 and GHRP6, they act on the ghrelin growth hormone secretagogue receptor. CJC1295 and tessamorelin are more similar in nature to sermorelin. I know Huberman likes sermorelin and he's used it in the past. As he hinted at, it was previously in clinical use predominantly developed in the late 1980s and branded as GREF, which was used to treat idiopathic growth hormone deficiency in children. It gained FDA approval in 1990, but by the end of 2008, it was clinically discontinued. And somebody actually petitioned to figure out why, and it's so annoyingly vague, but according to the Federal Register, essentially what happened was, since it was petitioned, they had to investigate if it was withdrawn for medical use for reasons of safety and efficacy. And the final answer was no, it was not discontinued for reasons of safety and efficacy. That's all I got. Since the late 2000s, it's been discontinued in the USA. Why? I'm not quite sure. My guess is something to do with money or under prescription, something along those lines, but who knows. When Huberman is talking about physicians who prescribe it though, I'm going to take a guess that he means those working at hormone clinics or optimization longevity places who are probably tied to a compounding company. And in my opinion, if anything raises question for safety and efficacy, it's probably getting it from an unreliable source. That said, Huberman was totally right about how it works. As we discussed about a minute ago, GHRH stimulates growth hormone and downstream action of IGF-1, hence why it would be used to stimulate growth hormone production in children who are deficient in it. The reason I am so fascinated by sermorelin is that it's shown it may be multifaceted in how it works, so much so that limited, and I highlight limited, data has shown it may increase testosterone. May has not been proven, but the idea that a GHRH agonist could somehow intervene with the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis is just too cool. And I've got plenty of videos on Samorolin. I'll link them in the description below so you can have more details about the studies I'm talking about. Finally, as we discussed ad nauseum, my biggest fears with growth hormone release is increased risk of cancer. Yes, many cancers are multifactorial in their development, whether it be hereditary or environmental exposure or certain lifestyle factors, but signaling growth, understandably, could come with its detriments. And we see it in people who suffer from growth hormone surpluses in patients with acromegaly, who usually have a pituitary tumor causing an excess production of growth hormone and IGF-1. These are just my thoughts based on my own research. I encourage you to do your own. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please throw us a like and subscribe if you did, a dislike if you just absolutely hated it. That said, I hope you have a great day, great weekend, and coming week, month, year, so on. So thank you, take care.